All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for the Human-Animal Interaction Research Series. This series is hosted by the University of Arizona College of Veterinary Medicine. And today I am delighted and honored to introduce the wonderful Dr. Nancy G. So I'll just give you a brief overview um, of her highlights. So Dr. G is a professor of psychiatry. She's the Bill Balaban Chair in Human-Animal Interaction and the Director of the Center for Human-Animal Interaction at Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond. Um, she's also the president-elect of the International Society for Anthrozoology, or, or ISAS. Congrats, Nancy. Um, she has extensive research and teaching experience, specialized in human-animal interaction for over the past 17 years. She's received multiple grants and awards, over 70 peer-reviewed publications, and has edited and contributed to numerous books, one of which is coming out soon, she might mention. Um, but to some, she's truly a legend in the field of human-animal interaction, and we are so honored and delighted to host her today. So please join me in welcoming Dr. G. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here. So thank you very much uh, for this opportunity to speak and also to talk about the state of the science in human-animal interaction research um, and talk a little bit about where we are and kind of my vision for the future. And just a quick disclaimer in this presentation, I'm going to focus most of my comments on dogs, but I recognize that there are other species involved in human-animal interaction, and I will bring them in towards the end. Um, but just to sort of make things easier, I'm going to focus mostly on dogs. From a historical perspective, uh, the process of domestication and selection has really happened over tens of thousands of years. And through this process, dogs have become adept at socializing with, uh, with humans. They're sensitive to our emotional states and social gestures. They're able to communicate using complex cues and they're able to form complex attachment relationships. Dogs emerged uh, from wolves by adapting to human social demands over a period of about uh, 35,000 years at least. Um, there's probably no other species on the planet as well matched to human social needs as dogs. And through this lengthy selective breeding process, we now have an amazing variety of dog breeds that come in all shapes, sizes, coat colors, types. Some dogs were bred for specific behaviors and others for the way they look. Dogs as a species represent an impressive variety in which there's literally a dog for pretty much every occasion. And then if we think about the importance of pets, take a look at these numbers. They represent sort of the numbers of dogs and cats in, for instance, the United Kingdom, the European Union, the United States, Canada. In, in the United States alone, some 63 million households have a dog. But there's a sobering reality with that. And that is that in the United States, children are actually more likely to grow up with a pet in their home than a father. So this indicates the degree to which animals can really have an impact on families and particularly on children. Dog companionship itself is not only widespread, but it's extremely varied. So in many ways, there's no doubt that dogs have been helpful to humans. For example, working dogs like assistance dogs for vision and hearing and mobility and PTSD and alert dogs for seizure and diabetic alert dogs. We also have detection dogs who help to sniff out drugs and bombs and cadavers and people who are lost or buried alive, and even the presence of COVID-19. Search and rescue operations involving dogs literally take place in every single earthly environment, as some of these images depict. And we certainly can't leave out therapy dogs. Uh, therapy dogs, as you'll see, play, play a role in much of what I'll be talking about. Sled dogs helped humans to really traverse cold and, and formidable terrain and move longer distances than we would have been able to do without them. Dogs herd and protect flocks of sheep, cattle, goats. They protect the safety of air travel. They, uh, they herd geese, geese and, and ducks and other birds away from airports, and they protect our leisure activities by herding these birds away from golf courses, for instance. In fact, apparently some golf courses are plagued by some pretty aggressive geese. And, <laughs> and again, dogs to the rescue. So dog sports, you, you know, we need to mention dog sports. They're on the rise. They include things like agility, fly ball, frisbee, dock diving, retrieving, obedience, scent work, high jump, many, many, many others. But many people acquire a, a dog for the simple companionship. Our long history together and the continued proliferation of dogs in our lives indicate that there's really something unique and special about this human-animal bond that we share with 
dogs and other companion animals. And the American Veterinary Association, uh, American Veterinary Medical Association defined the human animal bond in 2006 with this, with this really nice definition. And so now what I want to do is really get into, so what is the state of the science on this human animal bond? And to begin this conversation, I want to talk about the fact that this field, human animal interaction or anthrozoology, uh, is really a very young field. And so an indication of how well established a scientific field has become is to look at the number of randomized control trials that have been conducted. So I did a Google Scholar search with the terms random and human-animal interaction. These terms did not appear together in the published literature in a way that was connected to our current field of investigation prior to 1960. So this is a pretty, a pretty young field. Prior to 1960, the focus was on topics such as animal instincts and eugenics and the origin of, the origin of species. You'll notice that the last bar on this graph, the bar on the far right, it really represents only about three years, right? 20, 21, and 22. But look how high that bar is. So it's not a full decade. So we're really on pace to kind of set a record uh, in terms of the number of randomized control trials. And we can also uh, likewise take a look at publications, which can, uh, can reveal the growth of a field. So as you can see from this figure, which is going to appear in a forthcoming article, Publications and citations of published works on animal-assisted interactions and animal-assisted therapy are really growing at an exponential rate. So here's the question. What do we know about the research? And I want to start with pet ownership. Pet ownership can be challenging to study because it rarely allows us to make causal claims because it's subject to a selection bias. And, and what I mean by that is that people like to decide for themselves whether they want to own a pet and what kind of pet they want to own. Well, in science, we really want to randomly assign people to conditions. So that means we want to randomly assign some people to own a dog, other people to own a horse, and, and so on. And people aren't necessarily all that thrilled about that. So a question that I'm often asked is, well, is it good for me to have a pet? And so I liken this to, to owning a bicycle. Is it good for me to own a bicycle? If, if you don't ride it, it's probably irrelevant to your life. But if you ride it a lot, it's probably pretty good for you. In fact, it could probably really help you to get into shape. And so I think it's similar with pet ownership. I think it's likely that the, the more involvement and attachment we share with our pets, the more likely we are to accrue benefits or potential benefits from pet ownership. So with that said, what I want to do now is really talk generally about what the science shows with, with pet ownership. And I'm going to discuss this evidence really from a very top line perspective. So I'm not going to dig down into any of the research. I'm just going to talk about results. And the research typically categorizes participants based on whether they've checked a box indicating that they own a pet or not. So it often is sort of a dichotomy of yes, I own a pet or yes, I don't. And this dichotomy is not particularly nuanced. In other words, a pet may live in your house, but how involved are you with the pet? And so this is a, a particular interest of mine uh, with regard to pet ownership research, and that is just how involved people are with their pets. And so there is a nice um, uh, paper written by Danny Mills Group. Um, and in this paper, they point out that comparing pet owners to non-pet owners is a gross oversimplification of a complex relationship. And so much of what I'm going to talk about really does kind of oversimplify pet ownership. But as the field continues to grow, we're getting better at this. And we're starting to get at the subtle nuances of pet ownership and how much time do you spend with your pet and how attached are you to your pet and so on. With all that said, let's start by talking about what we know about children who have pets. They grow up with a pet in their home. So what I'm going to show you, each bullet point represents one or more study that demonstrated that particular result. So for example, you can see that children who grow up with a pet in their home, they tend to have reduced loneliness, depression, anxiety, fewer sick days from school. They're less likely to have allergies or asthma. And one study showed that five and six-year-olds are less likely to be obese. On the other side, children who grow up with a pet in their home have an increased amount of self-esteem, empathy. They're more popular with their classmates. They uh, have more engagement with education and reading and greater involvement in hobbies and clubs and my personal favorite household chores. So 
it, it is interesting that we see these, these kinds of connections, but I want to point out that the evidence here is not strong. It is correlational and it often lacks appropriate control conditions. So if we just take the allergies and asthma uh, result, for example, and there are lots of results showing this, if you consider a, a child has a very severe allergy to a pet, it's very likely the family will not own that pet. And so that automatically places that child with a severe allergy into the non-pet owning category. So that artificially inflates the amount of allergies and asthma, for example, that could be in that non-pet owning category. And so there are other things that affect whether these results are likely to appear. Okay, on adults who have pets, we see they have reduced anxiety, stress, annoyance, which I love, uh, risk of cardiovascular disease. And then we see some interesting results regarding depression. So hold that thought, I'm gonna come back to it. On the other side, we see increased social capital, motivation to walk, social interactions and support, happiness and relaxation. So now let's come back uh, to those depression results. So we see some nuanced results for depression. It suggests that there's a complicated relationship between depression and pet ownership. And it's entirely possible that we have to consider that people self-medicate for depression by acquiring a pet. Oh, you're feeling down. You should get a pet. You'll feel better. And I think that sort of thing does happen. So again, I think it's important to point out that the results here are mixed. I've given you a sampling of these results, but sometimes we see non-significant results or we see results in the other direction. And for reasons previously stated. And then for older adults, again, we see some decreases, decreases in loneliness, depression, anxiety, blood pressure, and stress, and increases in physical activity, social functioning, mental functioning, and stroke recovery. Also relevant to this slide, um, is the idea that older adults who are in poor health are less likely to own pets, suggesting that health status may be driving some of these results. And so it's important to keep that in mind that there are some, anytime you're looking at um, correlational findings, there can be a third variable that may be causing what you're seeing. So with that said, the evidence on heart health tends to be a little bit more compelling and noteworthy. So pet owners compared to non-pet owners have significantly lower blood pressure, plasma triglycerides and cholesterol, and are more likely to be alive when you're following a heart attack. And in fact, a few years ago, <clears throat> the American Heart Association uh, published a scientific statement basically saying that pet ownership, particularly dog ownership, is probably associated with decreased risk of cardiovascular disease. And then they went on to say in the second bullet, and, and, and this isn't small, is that pet ownership, particularly dog ownership, may have a causal role in reducing cardiovascular disease. So that was, a, that was a pretty big statement. Now, even though the preponderance of evidence here with regard to heart health is more convincing, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that the research is not universally consistent with regards to heart health. There are some studies that show opposite findings or null results. So it's important to consider that when talking about this evidence. Okay, now I'd like to turn our attention to animal interactions. So this is instead of pet ownership, this is interacting with an animal. And in these studies, you can manipulate whether or not people interact with an animal, how long they interact, the type of interaction, the population settings, whether it's structured or unstructured, goal-driven, even what type of animals are involved. And so with these studies, it's important to point out that the evidence here is stronger because from a scientific, scientific perspective, we can build a stronger study and we can start to make causal inferences. So similarly to what I covered with pet ownership research, I'm gonna provide some top line sort of information on these interaction studies and what the results tend to show. So for children in animal assisted interactions, and, and what we did is we, we conducted a couple of systematic reviews and you can see them referenced there at the bottom. And this, the findings that I'm reporting here are summarized in those systematic reviews. So what we see is that children who interact with animals tend to have decreases in things like impulsivity, aggression, salivary cortisol, skin conductance, social withdrawal, and risk behavior. And we see some interesting increases. So they have increases in terms of improvements in reading rate and accuracy and comprehension, memory, 
categorization, motor skills, adherence to instruction, attention, motivation, mood, responsibility, empathy, and social functioning. So you can see some really interesting results with some, I think, clearly defined outcome variables. For adults, we see decreases in uh, depression, agitation, PTSD symptoms, cortisol, heart rate, blood pressure, uh, increases in or improvements in uh, executive functioning, mood, social interactions, verbal verbalizations, social adaptive functioning and schizophrenia and quality of life in late stage dementia. So much, but not all of the, not all of the information that I've summarized here, you could find in uh, Aubrey Fine's uh, handbook on animal assisted therapy. Now, for, let's turn our attention now to older adults. In a, in a recent systematic review of the literature, Megan Mueller and I reviewed and evaluated the strength of evidence for 145 studies involving pets and older adults. And in that review, we found for older adults, they have decreased cardiopulmonary, neurohormone, and anxiety measures, decreased heart rate, muscle tension, and skin temperature, decreased blood pressure, and decreased risk of falls and hospitalization rates. We also found increased uh, physical, physical activity, walking distance and speed, and walking ability and stability. So although the evidence here is stronger, it's important to point out that no research really isn't without some issues or potential methodological challenges. And much of the work on animal interactions that I just described may involve small sample sizes. In some cases, it involves non-standardized measures. And in other cases, it involves the lack of appropriate control conditions. So there are also mixed and null results in this area. But even so, the preponderance of evidence is stronger and the quality of that evidence is stronger. So the evidence is stronger but nothing is perfect. So it's important to point out that although the evidence is stronger, there are still some issues as there would be with research in any area. Of course, I, I can't uh, do a presentation without talking about uh, hospital settings specifically. At my university, we operate the Dogs on Call program. And this topic is near and dear to my heart. Um, and this is an animal visitation program, dogs only, that visit throughout the VCU health system. And so the program involves 80 plus human and dog volunteer teams. They're re registered with therapy dog organizations and evaluated for safe uh, interactions in a hospital setting. And they visit throughout the health system and they go into pretty much every area, except they don't go into the cafeterias where there's food being served and they don't go into surgical suites uh, or isolation rooms. So we keep them out of rooms where patients have tested positive for COVID, but otherwise uh, they go everywhere else, including labor and delivery. Yes, we have dog teams in there while women are in the middle of pushing uh, and babies are appearing and there is a dog present. It's, it's pretty rewarding actually to be a part of this program. I also have my own dog in the program, but while I'm on the subject, I wanna talk a little bit about the research we've done on this program. So we've conducted the research right in the hospital and found that anxiety is reduced in psychiatric patients following a single visit from dogs on call. Fear is reduced by 37% and anxiety by 18% for those patients waiting for electroconvulsive shock therapy. Cortisol is significantly reduced after just a five minute interaction with a dog. And dogs on call, uh, when they are present in group therapy, it significantly increases attendance by patients and nursing staff perceive improved moods in their patients. So some really great uh, evidence on our dogs on call program. Just wanted to slip that in. So here I wanna ask the question, do companion animals make us healthier physically or, or psychologically? And the answer is it's possible. The research findings that I summarized here indicate that from childhood to older adulthood, owning and particularly interacting with companion animals is associated with a number of psychological and physical health benefits. As a field, we're grappling with some complexities that are involved in evaluating the strength and quality of that evidence. When we put all of the evidence in the context of those studies that show negative effects of the companion animals or null effects, we're often left with a common refrain. And that is more research is needed. Well, we're doing that. So we're in the middle of conducting that research right now. We're running three randomized control trials in a hospital setting 
And you can see that each of these are looking at, they're examining the impact of a therapy dog intervention on loneliness and related outcomes in hospitalized older adults, in hospitalized patients with mental illness, and in hospitalized children. So we're currently in the middle of collecting data on each of these studies right now. One of the interesting things that we're doing is we're also doing longitudinal follow-up at one month and six months, and we're also going to get medical records and look at expenses. So we'll be able to provide some information if there is any economic impact of therapy dog visitation during hospital stays. So why are these studies important? More randomized control trials are needed because they're really, they really represent the gold standard of research. They allow us to randomly assign people to conditions. We implement high quality measures. It includes a variety of measurement types, including physiological and psychological measurements. We do longitudinal um, evaluation to assess the time course of outcomes. And these studies involve the highest standards of ethical considerations for both the humans and the animals, which I think is really key for our field. So let's talk a little bit about complexity. The field faces a number of challenges related to sort of clearly stating the knowns and unknowns surrounding the human-animal bond. The primary reason for this is that the field is plagued by mixed results, also known as variability in outcomes. So you can see that we published a paper on this very topic in, in, in which some findings show positive outcomes, some show negative outcomes, and some are inconclusive with regard to the impact of an animal in that particular study. So I wanna point out that this variability in outcomes is not exclusive to this field. In fact, it's not uncommon to more established fields of study such as psychology and medicine. We need to remember that those other fields focus primarily on one complex organism, humans, and that those humans come in different genders and ages and religions and ethnicities and have many other important characteristics like how much they exercise or whether they eat nutritious meals. There are many such factors that impact the human health and well-being. Then if we begin to add on to that what our field adds, and that is the complexity of the animal side of the equation. Remember back to that wide variety of dog breeds? Dogs come in a wide variety of sizes and shapes, each of which are likely to have subtle or even dramatic behavioral differences and different health vulnerabilities. Even within a given dog breed, each animal has a unique personality that comes with their own set of likes and dislikes. And we aren't just talking about dogs. We complicate the work of researchers in our field by adding into this variability the many different companion animals that are included. Each of these have distinct nutritional and habitat needs, not to, not to mention the differences in appropriate handling and or interaction styles and displays of stress or fear, or dare I say enjoyment. I don't think we can understate the importance of the complexity of what we do in our field in human animal interaction or anthrozoology. It, and it is this very complexity that I think explains why so many of us are drawn to this field and why so many HAI research papers conclude with the statement, more research is needed. It's absolutely true. We need more research. Further, our field is complicated by the lack of the use of theory to drive research questions. In our systematic review that I mentioned earlier that Megan Mueller and I conducted, Remember, we reviewed 145 papers, and of those 145 papers that we reviewed, a mere 37 of them mention theory. That's a sparse 25.5% of those papers involving theory. Theory is needed to drive research and requires feedback and refinement from application. We recently published an article proposing the use of a dynamic version of the biopsychosocial model to organize existing findings, consider possible mechanisms of action, and guide future research. With that said, I think the field would also benefit from the use of small theories that focus on more specific outcomes in specific populations. Advancing the field can happen by taking small steps, also adding to the complexity and the joy and interest in our field is the widespread idea that generally speaking, 
We all love animals. This drives our interest and engagement in the field and the study of human-animal interaction. Unfortunately, it's also linked to some other potentially negative outcomes for our field. One such outcome is that the subject matter is of great interest to the press. Uh, they are very interested in telling a good story. They don't necessarily always report the nuanced conclusions that we carefully construct based on our own results, and we place them in the context of our research on the topic. Here's an example that I found. Pets are good for your health, and we have studies to prove it. Uh, okay, so let's break that down. First of all, it's using the word prove is a really big word in science. We don't banty that around very frequently. And then secondly, this article was fact-checked. So no, we don't have the studies to prove it yet. We're not there yet. The evidence is accumulating, but it takes a long time before scientists are willing to use that word prove. I also want to point out that we have a positive publication bias. We know that that exists in, in all scientific fields of study. So basically the idea is that studies that have significant results are much more likely to be published than those that do not. However, if we layer on top of that existing bias, the idea is that researchers who love animals may not want to do research on the negative aspects of companion animal ownership or interaction. Our field experiences a particularly large impact of this positive publication bias. So despite the complexities and the challenges that I've mentioned, I think we do have many reasons to be excited about what's happening in our field, but we need to be a little bit careful about how that result, how that research gets represented in the popular press. Um, also, I want to talk a little bit about some exciting new innovations. Um, research is happening in the field of animal behavior that's providing us with some incredibly interesting information, helping us to better understand the needs of companion animals. There are software applications that, um, that are available to examine postural information in both humans and animals, and other apps provide detailed information about this complex behavior between humans and animals, all of which lead to greater insights into the cognitive and emotional life of both species. Further, these sophisticated packages have been adopted by the neuroscience and anthology communities and basically build, build and, and grow our interdisciplinary focus and, and the potential for greater understanding in this field. Recent years have provided us with amazing advances in neurotechnologies, which have a broad potential for neuroscience research on both humans and animals. Our understanding of social cognition and and, uh, of humans and animals has blossomed in recent years, particularly for those neuropeptides like oxytocin and, and vasopressin. I know Evan is very familiar with this. Cortisol, we sorted out, we're sorting out appropriate methodologies for examining each of these in both humans and animals. Genetics research is extending into many different directions, such as tying specific genes to diseases and providing insights into historic process of animal domestication, and even optimizing agricultural processes. And the microbiome, research on the microbiome is showing us that dietary modulation of the gut microbiota may be a key, a key to disease management, and that's for both humans and animals. And it's interesting that we share much of that microbiota with the animals that we live with. These are just some of the exciting new innovations that are already impacting our field and are likely to take us in directions we've never dreamed of going before. So what does the future hold for our field. Now I'd like to paint a picture of my hope for the future of our field. So this is where I hope our field is going. And I think it is. I think I, I'm seeing trends in this direction. First, I hope that theories, both big and small, will be developed, refined, tested, and used much more frequently to drive both research and practice. I think our field will continue to grow as a part of that. We need to have a wide variety of research methodologies, including both qualitative and quantitative categories, with the key being that in all cases, they are implemented in high quality, powerful ways to provide the best possible information. Our research topics will span the full spectrum of many uh, ways that humans and animals interact. In other words, I hope we will study both positive and negative aspects of, 
and giving both sort of a balanced consideration in our research. The interdisciplinary nature of our, our field continues to be one of its greatest strengths. And with a wide variety of cross-disciplinary collaborations, I've been involved in a number of these, and it's very exciting to see the field from somebody else's perspective. But it brings cutting edge technologies from disparate fields together um, to, their, to the best advantage. In terms of animal welfare, I see animal welfare as continuing to evolve from that foundation of the five freedoms, uh, which focuses on sure, ensuring some kind of fundamentals such as freedom from pain, um, to a more consistent focus on quality of life for the animal. Researchers and practitioners hopefully will focus their attention more on whether the animal is enjoying their involvement and thriving in their current circumstances. Finally, and importantly, researchers and practitioners will commonly join forces to better understand um, and imp the important delivery details, such as dosage and timing and aspects of the interaction that are most effective. Which populations are most likely to benefit? What is the role of pet ownership history and so many other key variables? Feedback from practitioners will then be used to modify and build theories which drive more targeted research and refine and support applications and interventions. I envision a future where we have a solid foundation of research built on new technological innovations brought together from a variety of disciplines that will fundamentally reshape the public conceptualization of human-animal bond. I hope we move away from distorted portrayals of pets and that it will become more commonplace for people to accept animals for the non-human beings that they are, respecting their dignity, their needs, viewing them realistically, and granting them agency in the process. It is so important to our field that we highlight the inherent value of all companion animals and their role as our partners in the work that we do. We have an encouraging foundation of evidence on which to build, and this is an absolutely exciting time to be involved in research on the human-animal bond. And with that said, thank you again for your time and for the opportunity to present this overview on the state of the science. 